helping audiences understand new scientific discoveries and information. By studying the visual aspects of experiment and having the background of scientific studies, illustrators hold a unique place in the scientific community. Today, we are highly privileged to hear from such an eminent scientist, from illustrator, Dr. Ipsa Jain. I welcome you all once again to the seminar and hope you all find the seminar highly engaging, fruitful and beneficial for your future. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Thank you. So is the floor mine? Shall I begin? Or, uh, no, no. Uh, uh, can I wait for this one? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank you, Kritika, for the warm welcome on this great day. Now it's time to go to the Wednesday entertainment program. Here's the pieces of the entertainment program. And we like to acknowledge our energy student, Mr. Omar Rafael Bhattacharya, My thanks to respect, uh, Chief Coordinator, sir, and our beloved coordinator, Dr. Rain Panisalam, sir, 
uh, when me and Dr. K. Rajeshwari, uh, Army Secretaries, uh, proposed the idea of uh, educating the scientific illustrator for the top who has science background, he readily accepted our proposal and I have contacted uh, Dr. Ipsa J for the talk on science illustration. And an important name uh, of the present day, your UG and PG students. He happily accepted our invitation. He has, uh, and uh, to the credits of uh, Dr. Ipsa J, he has completed BSc in MSc Geology in Karji College, University of Delhi. And she has completed her PhD in molecular oncology in the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Followed by, she did have postdoc in the Institute of Stem Cell Science and Regenerative Medicine in Stem Bangalore. Uh, you all may wonder how the people from this much qualification in science become science illustrator. I think that there is no wonder to create her own tips on that. It all because of their interest and passion towards art and science. But also, in all this situation, I have a low question to Dr. Sanjay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, excellent. So uh, if whoever is presenting can stop presenting so I can share my presentation, that would be nice. Uh, thanks everyone for having me here. Um, I love talking to young students and I'm hoping that uh, this will be something that you will enjoy as well. I'm going to start sharing my presentation and what happens when I share my presentation is that I can't uh, see if something happens in the chat. Uh, but please feel free to interrupt me and ask me any questions or any doubts or anything else that you would like to share or say. Uh, pardon um, Pardon me, ma'am. Can you just raise your volume, ma'am? Yes, uh, sure. Yeah. So I was trying to say that uh, if anyone has any question while I'm presenting, please feel free to interrupt and uh, just ask right away. Uh, and I would like this talk to be engaging for all of us. Uh, yeah, let's go. All right, uh, so today uh, what I'm going to talk to you all about is the idea of drawing signs. And um, uh, why I get to talk about that, is, uh, uh, like uh, Kanan just mentioned, that I'm somebody who spent uh, most of her life training to be a scientist. And I still identify as one, but my tools have switched. Instead of using a pipette now, I use a paintbrush and pencil. And uh, uh, I will just briefly take you through my journey because it might be interesting to some of the students here, those who have interest in science and arts. I saw some of the work that your teachers shared with me prior, uh, you know, prior to this conversation. And I could uh, see that a lot of you are extremely talented and perhaps interested also. Um, so uh, I started as, uh, you know, as a usual PhD student, but towards the end of my PhD, I realized that I like the idea of sharing stories of science more than doing science itself. And uh, I always loved drawing. And especially if you train as a biologist, as a lot of you are, uh, training yourself, uh, you know, drawing is really part of your everyday routine when lab practicals and the diagrams and schematics we draw, there is a lot of drawing involved. So the drawing was always there. And then I started the idea of putting, uh, you know, my drawing skills and science together to communicate science. Um, one of the biggest experience that, uh, you know, really changed the way I think about science and drawing was, um, actually a dance performance that uh, I did with a lot of friends. And we used dance to talk about science of fig trees. And um, the response of uh, the audience was really good and really emotional. And that sort of conveyed the idea that how uh, art can tell stories of science in a way that kind of touches people um, in a way that's not like throwing information at them. And that's when I started practicing, making more art and trying to weave my uh, understanding of science and drawing together. At this point of time, I also spoke to a lot of other artists uh, across the world and I 
spoke to, wrote about their work and their journeys that helped me understand how i can grow my own work and my uh, you know and my uh, shape my own journey and the most fortunate experience really was the postdoctoral position that i got at instem bangalore uh, it was an unusual position because uh, i worked as a postdoc but instead of practicing regular science i practiced to science visualization so i was the one in the lab who was working with a pencil and photoshop um, unlike other students who were working with microscopes and pipettes and proteins and so on um so that was really cool and uh, I, hopefully the things that i will say today will kind of reflect the kind of things that i've learned um there and uh, at that time i also started you know sort of uh teaching and taking workshop giving a lot of talks to uh students like you in the hope that there'll be more uh, more people who will take up this kind of career um in the future and uh, just to prove that i am a credible uh, person to be speaking about science and art i'm just giving you a glimpse of my work here and before we go into the meat of the talk i will uh, just uh, let you know that uh, the examples today um, will be mostly from the world of biology and that just is coming from my own bias because I am a biologist by training, of course, and the talk will be part image display, uh, part reading. I will, I have, um, you know, my uh, thing written out. I will be reading from it directly and a part scientific talk where I will try to show you some of my work where I used a drawing, uh, you know, to do a scientific inquiry. Right. Uh, so let's dive in. Uh, if at any point, like I said previously, you want to ask anything, say anything, you can't hear me, just let me know. Um, right. So humans are curious by nature. We want to try things out to get distracted and generally look like we are wasting our time. And maybe we are wasting our time right now. Uh, sometimes we just want to see, observe what's happening around us for the heck of it. Uh, to observe is to look at, to listen, to touch, to taste, to smell something and noticing these tiny details to make a whole experience. And we gain useful evidence simply by noticing what's going around us. There is a high concentration of nerves and finely tuned muscles in our palms and our fingers. And that means as humans, we can do fine, intricate tasks, whether that's doing science or your experiments or whether that's doing drawing. And the thing is that the process of any material and knowledge production requires both the mind and the hand. And that together forms a complex whole. All right. So let's look at some of the historical work and some of the recent work to see how visuals have been relevant in science. So from 16th century to 19th century, the illustrated book, book is the material here, remained the gold standard for scientific communication, unlike the world we live in today. The detailed anatomical drawings in uh, Vesuvius uh, book, uh, or uh, the astronomical tables and Euclidean diagrams uh, used by Copernicus to support his argument on heliocentric universe, uh, the intricate drawings uh, of the microscopic world in Hooke's book, Micrographia, uh, the drawings of uh, light paths and so on in uh, Newton's book, Optics, book on optics, uh, the uh, arrangement of the scientific instruments um, in Lavoisier's work, uh, the element, uh, the notations uh, symbolizing different elements in Dalton's work, or uh, the uh, strata of the earth, uh, you know, earth showing its history in Lyell's principles of ge geology or floating microbes um, uh, in Cruikshank's book. Uh, so these were all drawings made based on observations made by hand. And then something changed uh, with the new era, came new 
uh, ways of recording and documenting science. So this is a photograph of sun's so solar surface. And uh, with the booming uh, technology and processes, whether it was the addition of um, photography or uh, um, X-ray machines or uh, cloud chambers or electron microscope, we had new ways of uh, recording uh, things around us. And that has uh, led to a boom in the way we visualize science and we visualize the world around us. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, one of the most recent examples where uh, technology has enabled visualizing a back black hole. So. All these images, uh, you know, from the past to the present, just to say that, uh, you know, the power of computer for visual representation has uh, large masses of data, has created a wave of image making that we have uh, not seen previously. And now we have, uh, you know, images as complex as this one. This one is called the brain bow. And if you look at it carefully, you see all of these neurons densely packed in space. And um, you know, uh, this data also records the connections they make in each other, make with each other. So image creation and image analysis has always been at the heart of scientific progress, scientific inquiry, and scientific communication. Um, but with this built-in instrumentation, as one of your teachers previously asked, is the ra role of hand, the hand that we spoke about just a few minutes ago, is the role of hand lost? And um, let's, let's, let's figure it out through the course of this talk. So um, this is an activity that you, I you know, usually like to do. But um, since I didn't prepare you all in advance, well, I'll just talk about this activity uh, rather than us trying it out right now. So uh, what I do um, in this activity is that I read out a passage from this amazing book called On, On Growth and Form. If you have it in your library, do uh, you know, at least take a gander through it. And uh, what? Uh, after reciting uh, after reciting that uh, passage, I ask people to draw it out. And uh, this is how different people interpret it. Uh, so each of us are imagining objects and processes in different ways with the clues given and then presenting them differently. And this is based on our experience with the tool, the pencil or the pen in this case and the prior knowledge of the subject matter. How much do we understand about this process? And the image I was describing is this. So you can see only a few images here are close to what I was actually trying to describe. Uh, so um, then let's move to the next segment. Um, probably a lot of you have uh, seen this image. Uh, this is uh, uh, in Darwin's note and uh, notebooks. Um, so in his notebook, uh, Darwin begins with the phrase, I think, but ends not in a sentence, but in an image. Uh, and that image represents key concepts of descent, diversity, and extension, making this great tree of life. So visual display are directly involved in scientific communication and in the very construction of scientific facts and observation. Observations are fundamental to all research methods. These beautiful images that Maria Sibylla Marian uh, drew for her book, Metamorphosis Insectorium Surinamesium, you can look her up if you have, you're not aware of her work. Um, and these images, these books were a product of decades of uh, meticulous observations of life cycles of insects. Most of our images were made from life or freshly preserved specimens. Uh, she shows moths uh, laying eggs, caterpillars feeding on leaves, and, uh, and she puts it all together in very complex compositions containing a variety of life stages and a variety of life forms accurately depicted. And what she used to do was she used to make singular studies of all these processes and then uh, when it came to the making of final drawing, she will put them all together to make this whole composite and uh, where the relationships and the texture and the color of the original are retained. Seeing 
is in some way an art which must be learned. In his uh, preface to the book, Micrographia, Rob, okay, uh, um, Micrographia, Robert Hooke wrote that all that was required for studying nature was a sincere hand, a faithful eye to examine, and to record the things themselves as they appear. In this passage, Hooke implies with his words and pictures that he acted as microscope's assistant by simply recording whatever appeared through the lens of that instrument. So this illustration of an ant at a scale that is many times its actual size highlights the insect's spiky limbs, brittle structures by uh, juxtaposing it against a stark white background and thereby effectively transforming this seemingly familiar animal and ant into an exotic and mysterious creature. Hook built up his images from numerous observations made from multiple vantage points under different lighting conditions and with lens of differing powers. Vision is not a mechanical recording of elements, but rather an apprehension of significant structural patterns. This is one of my favorite stories in how drawing changed science. In this micrograph, the darkly colored cells that are closely knit together punctate an otherwise relatively uniform tissue. To make these images, Saunders immersed uh, early chick embryos, live ones, in a specific dye, a vital dye, which colored the cells without disturbing their normal processes. And after washing, pigment remained only in particular kinds of cells. Initially, he believed that these cells were precursors to mel melanocytes. Things changed when he mapped these blue cells in the developing embryo. After staining and fixing tissue slices, he would trace the boundary of these tissues, mark the these images by solid line, and position each of the blue cells onto the glass plates with dots and by lining up these different glass plates together he noticed something that these cells were actually not pigmented cells but the cells that were dying in the process of making these digits so we need to show the real world not uh, so this is what he inferred from the images. So we need to show the real world and not lines and numbers as we strive to create visual solutions for visual problems. The image here is a painting of myoglobin that or the first protein structure that was ever solved using X-ray crystallography. And the painting was created by this artist called Arvind Jais who worked for the Scientific American. And this article was titled The Three-Dimensional Structure of a Protein Molecule by John Kendrew, the scientist who solved the structure. So uh, Gaze, the artist, created this painting by first photographing an actual physical model of the molecule from multiple point of views, and then creating this volume sketch and studies before making this final painting. And he made a lot of refinements, tweaks, and adjustments based on the feedback from the scientists. But he also distorted these things a little bit just to show uh, the part that he really wanted to show or needed to show to show how this molecule actually works. So he wanted to draw the protein not exactly as it was, but to show how it worked. He called this process selective lying and claimed that this is the one of the special talents of a knowledgeable artist, which is basically him describing what a scientific illustrator needs to do. A computer could draw a protein given the right set of coordinates in today's time, but who would tell it exactly what to draw? Right. In 1968, Waddington tells us Science is something more than a collection of conceptual or practical results. It is also an activity, and it, its practice involves as a very important part the exercise of the faculties of insightful perception, big words, of the natural phenomena and 
imaginative creation of new concepts. That's not so big word, imaginative creation of new concepts. So image on the left uh, is a top view of what is called as Waddington landscapes, which is a visual metaphor where a ball represents uh, a cell and the paths it can take are basically uh, the paths possible in this valley. And all these different paths lead to different outcomes. And on the right is shown what might be underneath the surface, these different pegs uh, pulling onto the surface and basically controlling the patterns that can form on the top. And the, this, these are representative of the uh, genetics um, uh, of whatever is making this landscape. And what this landscape, uh, what this visual metaphor does very well is stimulate visual thought. Uh, and visual thought is making you think about how would the genes change the surface and how will that affect the outcome of, uh, you know, what the cell phenotype is eventually going to be like. And to paraphrase Warrington himself, his artful representation helps to loosen the joints of science's imagination creating a space for associative play required to introduce new concepts in theory formation. The interesting thing is that um, this ball in uh, Waddingst Waddington's landscape remains the same over time as it rolls down the valley. It does not undergo any changes in its shape or any morphological transformations. A contemporary artist, uh, Gemma Anderson, and her collaborating scientist imagined overcoming this uh, limitation by uh, re replacing this ball with what is called, what she calls as an isomorphogenesis transformation. So if you look at these parts, uh, there the starting ball, a ball changes its shape differently across different parts, indicating different outcomes. And uh, so now we, oh, okay, we'll uh, skip this part. So um, basically what she is able to do with her work is uh, allow us to uh, change the way we think about the static nature of the ball. Waddington's landscape allowed for the stat, uh, you know, dynamics within the landscape. And the only dynamism he gave to the ball was its movement, but she also gave dynamism to the form. So her creativity um, allowed for the formation of new associations and concepts. And it requires, like the process even for us requires uh, abandoning our preconceived notions. To be creative, we must let our minds wander. They say hand drawing must not be allowed to disappear. And they say this uh, not because of its use in scientific illustration, but also because of its potential to form insight and understanding and to share this understanding and to enhance creativity um, in scientists and artists alike. Right. Now, a Renault, a collaborator of mine, said drawing enables creations of images that are more abstract than photographs, but have more depth and are more accurate than schematics. Drawing can provide special spatial, uh, which is to do with space, visualizations that could never be photographed or easily visualized. And uh, together, we wanted to uh, create some uh, drawings of a cargo being carried across the cell. And uh, that's, so this is the part where uh, some of the work that I have done during my postdoc, this is previously unpublished data, still an unpublished data. So I'll take you through this process. So uh, you don't necessarily need to know what this molecule is so much, uh, except to understand that this is kind of a motor that walks on a particular molecule inside the cell, which is, I mean, supra molecule called the microtubules. So all you need to imagine is like, this is like a vehicle on a road. And so I started out by, you know, uh, just looking at the form, like how does this molecule look like? Looking at the form of this uh, molecule uh, from its structural data, I made some loose drawings and I made some more, sorry, finished drawings. Once I understood just the basic form, 
I um, wanted to understand. So this uh, molecule kind of works as a dimer, uh, you know, so the two things are together. So I uh, wanted to understand how this works as a dimer. So I started exploring the dimer. And the moment I started exploring the dimer, I started asking a lot of questions. How is the front view different from back view? How are the two things arranged to each other? How, where is the cargo with respect to this molecule? Is it on top or is it behind? Is it uh, a situation like where, uh, you know, you um, put your suitcases on top of the car or is it a situation like a trunk where it's actually lugging behind or even a different situation where it's like uh, a pickup truck, uh, you know, carrying a broken car. So, uh, so we asked, so I asked all of these questions and then I looked to literature to find some of these uh, answers. So through this, uh, you know, process of iterations where I made these drawings repeatedly and each time I uncovered new problems and new questions, uh, for, uh, for example, some of the questions here I asked, like, what are the other proteins that interact with this molecule? Uh, what's the angle of, you know, how the tire and the road interact? Uh, um, and uh, what happens when this molecule is exchanged with this molecule? How does the shape change? And does that shape change affect how the cargo is binding? And all of these questions. But after figuring out everything, I made this final drawing. Uh, you know, uh, which was a summary of everything that was understood or known at that time and including uh, what was not understood and, and not known at that time. So the parts that are kind of, uh, I wasn't sure about how it worked. Uh, those are the things that I have uh, drawn in, uh, you know, uh, faint lines where the things that we understood far more clearly are the things that I've drawn uh, in, you know, solid line. And after understanding, uh, you know, how uh, this form looks, so I initially looked at the individual molecule, then I looked at the dimer complex um, and the whole form. Then I next wanted to understand how does this molecule walk because its main function is essentially to walk on the road. So I looked a lot, a lot of literature again and uh, uh, tried to understand that data and then use that data to make guesses on um, you know how this molecule would work and um, the, the the two things that i would like you to uh, sort of um, note at this point is that so there are two molecules so uh, there are two uh, different kinds of movement possible where one is like it's kind of like us walking where uh, one foot moves and the second move fo uh, foot moves and so on so that's uh, uh, you know it's called i think head on head movement and the other one is inchworm, where if uh, A moves ahead, then B moves, but the B is still behind the A. So something is always in front. So, um, uh, I mean, without being offensive to anyone, uh, it's, if you've seen the uh, movie Omkara, it's kind of how Langrata Yagi used to work. Um, right. So uh, by, uh, then what I did was I made these molecules work with these kinds of different permutations and combinations. And these are the drawings that came out of it. Now I'm gonna play them again and you will see what's happening. It doesn't matter which drawing I am on right now. Right. Uh, but see, in equal number of steps, they covered different distances, right? So uh, now this became a way for me to hypothesize that what kind of uh, you know walk is more likely than the other so with uh, so basically during this drawing of exercise to the whole process which required reading up literature and iterations not only i increase my own understanding of what we know i also increase the field's understanding of what are the things that we don't know and there are still a lot of questions that uh, the work, uh, the drawing work that I did and the data in the literature does not really answer. And these become potential uh, things and uh, potential hypotheses for people to um, explore. Uh, now, um, I mean, this is an activity that you can try right now, maybe in your imagination, if you don't have the time to draw. It's just like, look at this image, and I'm not going to tell you right now what this image is, literally. 
but just imagine what you think will happen to it in a minute or in a second or in an hour or in a year or in a century. And again, when I do this exercise, different people actually come up with different answers or like, like different possibilities. And that what what it goes on to show that work, uh, my work and this idea goes on to show that, you know, hypothesis that may be worth pursuing, may be realized uh, visually and uh, they may, uh, you know, and what happens is that when we do this is uh, we come up with hypotheses based on our creativity and our imagination that is not limited by feasibility. So more often than not, when we think of scientific experiments, we think about what is possible for us to do right now. And that kind of limits the uh, exploration we take. And by using drawing as a method to build hypothesis, you kind of break that barrier. I'm going to share one more example. So, uh, you know, in workshops like these, uh, um, especially where I get to spend uh, much longer time with the students and uh, get to make them draw things. I asked students to draw cells from memory. And these were students like you who were pursuing biological sciences and had, had access to create, uh, you know, all the good uh, books. And these are the diagrams they drew. And on the side, you see diagrams that have been drawn by some lawyer friends of mine. and. Uh, what really comes through is that a circle within a circle image is somehow still the uh, form that people remember the most, except the level of details uh, remembered are higher by uh, you know, a science student compared to uh, uh, somebody who studied a uh, long uh, time ago. And uh, the, in both of these cases, the, the idea that uh, sort of struck me is that Everybody remembers the cross section of the cell, whereas cell in itself is a 3D object. And that actually leads to this <clears throat> misconception, even in science students, that we think of cells as like some flat things and not things which have volume. So I wanted to change uh, that idea. So I started working on a series uh, of uh, genes and I built, came up with this visual metaphor where I sliced up an orange, which is a familiar object, along with a cell. And then we looked into the slice of an orange. We also looked into the slice of a, a cell. So by uh, comparing the 3D form of an orange to a slice, I was hopeful that people will be able to build together the idea that what we look at is a cross-section of a cell. So different uh, audiences, trained and untrained in sciences, so, uh, when they looked at this work, they could identify relationships between organ and organelles and their shapes, their polarity, and so on, even if they did not understand, uh, you know, even if they did not know what the terms are, they did not know necessarily that this is a mitochondria or a cilia or a nucleus, but they could point out things like the that this shape, which um, it was related to mitochondria is like, for example, always mostly at the periphery, right? So, um, so the idea is that we see, but we do not see. We see, uh, we use our eyes, but our gaze is fleeting and glancing. Previously, uh, considering its object, we see the signs, but not their meanings. We are not blinded, but we have blinders. So we need to see things closely. So with this scientific uh, argument, Watson and Crick converted this first image, the X-ray diffraction, diffraction photograph taken by Rosalind Franklin, uh, into uh, a physical model of DNA, making the, uh, the physical molecule a possibility. And what is interesting about this molecule is that it applies not only to the DNA that was used for the experiment, but to any DNA. And whatever they realize about the DNA molecule from this one interpretation holds true for any other DNA molecule that one might find. And so from an, a visual description, they went to explanation. So there was a shift in 
uh, how we looked at this image. Because now it was very easy for us to imagine a DNA replication and how this chain, uh, the double helix chain, might be a template for RNA making and for more DNA making. And uh, while I uh, do not claim that images um, are like only images are integral to scientific thinking, but it is undisputable that for scientific th thinking and and sometimes like a more complex version of scientific thinking, uh, more than words, images are required. Uh, um, when probing into the unknown, drawing is an ideal tool because drawing is thinking, pointing, it makes things present and puts them at a distance. It is a mode of inquiry. Drawing can represent seen and unseen, the known and the unknown. With that, I would like to thank you for your attention. These are the references in case you want to look them up. And uh, um, thanks to uh, Minaj and lab members, Karsten Junk and Breno Shabrier, who were my collaborators for the dining work, other collaborators, and all the previous geniuses who have made possible uh, for me to do the kind of work I do. And for those who are interested to look up more of my work, you can find me on social media. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I use my moniker, Ipsa Wonders. You can also find my website at uh, ipsawonders.com. I'm happy to take any uh, questions that you may have at this point. Wonderful. Uh, Thank you. So now the session is over for this session. If any student have any clarifications, both in online and online, can uh, ask man. Good morning, ma'am. It was interesting to hear from you. It was really cheap. Uh, sorry, Dharani, I couldn't hear you very well. There was a lot of. Uh, are you using a mic, mic, and not a? Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Yeah. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, Dharani, if you want, you could maybe even type your question if uh, audio feedback is an issue at your end. Good morning, ma'am. It was interesting to hear from you, ma'am. It was really changed my point of view of seeing diagrams and my questions on tools which are available to make digital scientific illustration and which type of diagram is best to illustrate the diagram more effectively? So uh, when it comes to tools, uh, I, I, like you can use different softwares like Adobe Illustrator or Adobe Photoshop or Procreate or whatever. But um, in my experience, uh, it's not the tool that matters. It's the idea that matters. I do a lot of my work with uh, you know pencil on paper, uh, literally. And I just scan things up and put them up online. Uh, so, but uh, I would not want to discourage you from learning the online tools, uh, digital tools. Um, and uh, when it comes to using the kind of image, there is no one clear answer because uh, it matters a lot about what is it that you are trying to say and to whom are you trying to say. For example, if you're talking uh, to your classmates or to your teachers or to other scientists, the kind of uh, complex images that uh, we can understand is not something that you will be able to use for scientific communication, for example. Uh, so like a lot of um, uh, uh, people end up using the textbook kind of diagrams when it comes to science communication. That doesn't work because we are very uh, used to uh, reading these kind of images. We understand that you know, if I draw a circle here, which represents a protein, you and I can imagine what that protein is and see how that protein interacts with other proteins. 
but this kind of visual language is not necessarily something that everybody understands it requires a certain level of training to be able to understand that so that doesn't work so there's no clear answer and it has to be decided based on the context content and your intent yeah, uh, and that's something that you will figure out by practice. Uh, but if you're interested, you can look at my work. Hopefully, uh, some of that will uh, help you think about how to think about your own work when uh, you're thinking about different audiences. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Welcome. Any other questions? First of all, I, I would like to thank for your informative talk, ma'am. Welcome. Can you please tell us the scope of scientific illustrator in the various fields? In which field? In various fields, ma'am. Various fields. Yeah. Right. Uh, right. So, uh, like in the Indian context, at least right now, there are no proper jobs, uh, you know, for scientific illustrators. It's kind of hard that way because you live a freelancer life. Uh, but that also means that there is a lot of opportunity for you to work with different kinds of teams and do different kinds of things. Uh, so you can do several things, like you can do something which is called like medical illustration or natural history illustration, where you make drawings which are very close to, uh, you know, the reality, uh, so to speak, um, uh, and where accuracy is really, really, really important. Uh, then you can do uh, more graphic design kind of work where you do uh, things more like posters or uh, uh, something to that uh, effect. Or you can do other things. Um, you can do my kind of work, which is more to do with science communication. And uh, then uh, there are people who I know work with movie makers uh, to make science fiction movies. You can be a comics artist who makes science-based comics. We have a few of those in India as well. Uh, in fact, if I'm not wrong, your teacher, Kanan, also makes a lot of science comics. Uh, and with respect to outcome, you can work in science communication, you can work in education, you can work in entertainment, you can work in legal if you are a medical illustrator. Um, and uh, you know you can even have your own line of merchandise or something if you are a designer. Um, the possibilities are there, but yeah, it is a hard life because you have to fight your way through it. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, uh, is this something that you would like me to do? Sorry, I didn't hear you clearly. Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, actually, uh, we have entries from various uh, for these con uh, contests, and we have selected some uh, entries, and we are now showcasing it for the others to view it, ma'am. Nice, nice, nice. Thank you, ma'am.
So those were the selected entries from the uh, contestants. And I now request uh, Dr. Rajesh Sharma to announce the winners. Thank you, ma'am. It gives me a real pleasure to announce the best entry of Sci Art Hub Contest that was conducted as a part of two days virtual seminar entitled A Juncture of Classical and Contemporary Research in Biological Sciences. And before announcing the best entry, I would like to thank all the entrants on behalf of the organizing committee who have exhibited their creativity and their tireless effort along with their academic. On behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to express our gratitude to our beloved judges of the event, Dr. P. Dimmel, Assistant Professor of Biotechnology, and Mr. Ashok Kumar, Assistant Professor of Computer Science Department for their judgment. And I will proceed with the announcement of the best entries. Uh, the first category is about the favorite microbes from our own college. It is in Rajesh. Second BSc Microbiology. Mr. Praveen, Mr. Praveen Kumar, second MNC Microbiology of Madhra College. Uh, there are two more best entries from outside participants. Ms. D. Sharmila, second BSc Microbiology of, from Vivekananda College of Arts and Science, Tirchankot. Ms. Jayashi Lee from Karpalam College, Coimbatore. The next category is about favorite discovery in microbiology. Our own college uh, students, uh, Ms. Rajeshwari, third BSc Microbiology is being uh, given a best entry and then Ms. Asha, Ms. Asha of 3rd DAC Microbiology, Middle College. Then finally, the best, best entries among the comic strips for scientific discoveries. The best entry is uh, Shakti Shri of 3rd DAC Microbiology, Middle College. Ms. Pavitra, 3rd DAC Microbiology, Middle College. The outsiders, outside participants, Ilakya M, 3rd BSc Microbiology from Sri Bharati Arts and Science College for Women, Pudukotai. So these are all the best entries and congratulations for the winners or who have been announced as best entrants. Thank you and thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Now I'd like to call upon Ms. Mangala Nanchia, second MSc Microbiology, to a vote of time.
thank you all for this uh, wonderful uh, day. A few announcements for the participants. Feedback link has been uploaded in the chat box, and we will get your certificate, certified a certification. Sorry, your certificate tomorrow in your uh, mail. So now uh, we all will stand for our national anthem. <laughs> Thank you students, thank you participants, thank you participants, uh, those who are in online, thank you very much and uh, hope to meet you all in an seminar.